this evening's going to work is really casual. Um, and uh, so there are going to be some introductory remarks, and then we'll dive into um, the whole concept, which is photography and the refugee crisis. I think you all know that. Um, I know most of you, so thank you for coming out. For those I don't know, I'm Kathy Edelman. Uh, this is my friend and business partner, Annette Skugadal. We just started um, Case Art Fund, which is a not-for-profit dealing with humanitarian rights, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, but before I do all that, I'd like to thank Leslie Thomas, who finally arrived so that we could get started, dear, who is the one responsible for Artworks Project uh, and um, is responsible for this discussion tonight. She asked if, we c if they could collaborate with us, and uh, we were like, sure, because we're all about collaboration. And um, Annalise is the executive director. And before we get started, I'd like you to just say some remarks about Artworks Project for those of you who haven't been here before. Hi, everybody. Um, like Kathy said, I'm Annalise. Uh, thanks so much for coming out and being here with us tonight. Just to give you a little bit of background on what Artworks does, uh, we were started in 2006, and we are a human rights advocacy organization that uses primarily documentary film and photography. If you saw the exhibition coming in, Deported an American Division, that's our current um, exhibition from our Emerging Lens winner. Please take a look on your way out if you haven't checked it out yet. We also just finished a feature-length documentary film called The Prosecutors that is advocating for the end of impunity for perpetrators of sexual violence and war, which was directed by Leslie, so keep a lookout for announcements about that. And then also I know we have a couple of people in the audience tonight who do work in direct services with refugees, and I know Syrian Community Network is here. Is anybody else here that's in the direct service world? Okay, Maya is it, so please uh, find Maya. Where, where, Maya, where? Maya's right here. If you have any questions about ways to get involved with some of Chicago's direct service organizations, I'm gonna direct literally everyone to you. <laughs> um, and then for those of you new to our works, just a really super quick announcement. One program that we're having next week at Fourth Presbyterian Church on October 2nd, is the Interfaith Immigrant Justice Vigil. So we'll be projecting images from this and um, there will be, and we'll be recognizing uh, the continued um, separation of immigrant families at the border and et cetera. And then also we're gonna be announcing a fundraising campaign soon. Um, so please keep an ear out for that. And thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's really great to be here, and it's, it's really nice to have such a good turnout. Um, so um, before we get started, I just wanted to read something that, um, that we wrote as an introduction. Um, I wanted to explain how the topic came about. Um, for the past few years, Annette and I have struggled with the fact that we know photography can affect change. As many of you know, I've been talking the talk. Uh, both politically, personally, and emotionally, and yet there's a, um, a huge deluge of images on a constant basis that no one's paying attention to. Um, almost daily, the front page in the New York Times shows a corpse or a famished child or some other form of tragedy, and we simply turn the page. We all know Vietnam was the first, quote, picture war, and many of us can cite the photos that help create change and end the war. Nick Oot's image of a naked nine-year-old Kim Phuc running down the streets outside Trang Bang, Eddie Adams' photo of a general shooting a Viet Cong prisoner in the head, and Malcolm Brown's photo of the self-immolation of a young monk on the streets of Saigon. On September 2nd, 2015, a three-year-old washed up on the shore in Turkey, photographed by a Turkish journalist named Nilufer Demir, I think. Apologies if that's not how it's pronounced. For 24 hours, we were outraged, and then the paper went into the recycle bin. On August 17th, 2016, numerous papers around the country showed an image of a bloody child from Aleppo in the back of an ambulance with an empty expression on his face. The photo was actually a still image from a video filmed and circulated by the Aleppo Media Center. For 24 hours, once again, we were outraged, and then we moved on to the next horror. It was then that Annette and I decided to put together Case Art Fund. Our mission is to give support and exposure to fine art photographers whose projects focus on humanitarian issues and create a positive impact on social awareness, human rights, and education. We firmly believe that photographs can affect change. And with this as a premise, what you're seeing behind me um, are photographs. Um, I think we, st oh, we didn't, we're still going, of Omar Imam, who we've been using a Case Art Fund as a proof of concept. He's an artist that I actually represent. 
I own a gallery, for those that don't know, I own a gallery in Chicago that I represent, and he graciously allowed us to use his work as a proof of concept of the kind of work we will be supporting. Um, and then about 45 minutes before we came over here, I was showing Annette Jeff Wolin's work, who happens to be in the audience, and she's like, why isn't he up there? You know, because I said, but that's also the kind of work we'd be supporting. Um, to show you that we're not interested personally in photojournalism, um, but in, in fine art and, and how it actually has affected change. And with that said, uh, Jeff Wolin's work, which we're not in yet, so um, Omar's work has been, um, sh is being shown around the world right now. And um, Omar is a Syrian who was abducted and kidnapped and tortured um, and let go uh, after a ransom was paid. He ended up um, leaving um, Damascus um, and uh, settling in um, Lebanon with his parents and uh, wife. Uh, he was fortunate to get hired to take photo, uh, to, to work for some, I forget which, an NGO of some nature. Um, and, that, and, and he was taking photographs and that's how he got into the camps and he met all these Syrians in the camps and these, are, these were faux, these are like fake photographs, right, about real things. They would tell a story, then he'd come back and they would recreate it as best as he could. Um, and the, 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 this is, it was at the Nobel Center in Oslo, which is where Annette's from. Um, it's been all over, and it's really a creating change, it's cre and change for us is awareness. Um, Jeff Wolin's work, uh, which was done in like, like 1992, um, of Holocaust survivors, also created change. Many of them had never even spoken to their families about it. So sometimes change is on the individual level, sometimes change is on the social level, it can be political, we all know this, correct? Uh, so the premise of tonight's talk is uh, the photography that we're being seen, that's being seen right now on a daily basis dealing with the refugee crisis, we personally uh, believe is not creating the change that we want to see. And so that's going to be the dialogue that we're having tonight. Uh, with that said, Annette's going to um, introduce each panelist, uh, read their little bios that they sent us, and then they'll explain their um, you know, little you know, spiel on, on, on their organizations, and then we'll dive right into the questions. It's really going to be a free form, so if you want to just interrupt and ask questions, please do, and then there will be like a Q&A afterwards if nobody speaks up. Thank you. And welcome to all three of you. We haven't really, sorry, we dive into us first, sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> on the far corner, um, Lina Sergi. Atar, is that right? Sergi. Sergi, sorry. She's the founder and CEO of Karem uh, Foundation. She's a Syrian-American architect and writer from Aleppo. She was named, I have to read this, I'm sorry, because of the fact that it, they do a lot of good work, these people. She was named one of the Good uh, Magazine's 2016 Good 100 for Karem's innovative uh, work with Syrian refugees. Sure I can. Is that better? Yes. Very good. Um, Let's go back here. She was named one of Good Magazine's 2016 Good 100 for Karam's innovative work with Syrian refugees. Her articles and essays have been published in the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, Foreign Policy, Politico, The Atlantic, and BBC, and she has appeared on CNN, NBC News, BBC News, Huffington Post, NPR, and other media outlets. Lena has spoken about the Syrian humanitarian crisis at schools, universities, and institutions, including RIS, RISD, Harvard, University of Chicago, John Hopkins, North and Western, the New School, Phillips Exeter Academy, King's Academy in Jordan, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, New America, the Aspen Institute, and others. Atara is a co-founder of How Many More? Project served as um, a project, sorry serves as a, the chair of the board of directors of the Syria campaign and is a non-resident fellow at New America. And um, Lena, could you just talk a little bit more about Karam and the foundation that you are heading up and what you do and, and also who you're working with? Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. and. Uh, it's really important to see Omar's work. Uh, it's the second time I've seen his work. I've seen it at your gallery, Catherine, and I think it's the images speak for themselves uh, when the artwork is at this quality of telling stories of Syrian refugees and the humanitarian crisis. And it's funny, the two examples that you gave, I'd prepare to talk about the Elan Kurdi picture of the washed up toddler and Amran because I actually wrote a piece or maybe 
Syrians at this point feel like they've told their story thousands of times over the past eight years. So um, we've talked so many times about how one image um, can make, create a global outrage. And we're very grateful for that as Syrians. We're not complaining about that because those are the moments where people actually see the crisis again. And that's where people donate again. And we're able to do more work to help people. But at the same time, um, these are children. So many of the children's images become, go viral. And it becomes all about a hashtag, hashtag save Aleppo, hashtag save Hamas, hashtag save Dara. And we're literally going over the map of Syria where everybody knows this is the area now where there's an onslaught, Ghouta, earlier this year. It's been less than a year than Ghouta, which is an area right outside Damascus where hundreds of thousands of people were displaced and were under siege for years, basically under siege by their government, starving to death, eating grass and insects um, as we're watching. And then they were forcefully displaced from their homes and went to northern Syria. And now we actually have hashtag save Idlib, which is the northern um, part of the country where everybody in the world knows, including all of the world leaders, sitting right now in UN General Assembly week and knowing that the Assad regime and its allies will plan to uh, create an assault, aerial strikes, chemical weapons on this region that has over 3 million civilians. And so for Syrians, we feel that these stories are told so many times. And now we can tell you in advance what will happen and the change doesn't come. And so for us, the day after the media stops covering our stories and the pictures become forgotten, uh, we wonder about, are we, do we just exist to have images that go viral and be these hashtags until the next time? Whereas every single day, Syrians are being displaced, Syrians are being killed, more children are growing up without access to school, without access to basic necessities, and and that's very sad. And now we're going to be, we're close to entering our eighth year of this war that has no end. Um, and um, our work, Karam Foundation, it's an organization that I founded actually here in Chicago uh, in 2007. And our focus right now has been for the past few years on education and working with Syrian refugee youth because we don't want to have this lost generation. And we want to be able um, to give every Syrian child that we work with um, access to opportunity and job skills so that they're more than refugees and that they could reach their dreams and their goals. And actually, because I'm an architect by training, I don't practice architecture. Um, I remember very vividly, I'm Syrian American. I grew up, I was born in New York City. And when I was 12 years old, my parents, who are both doctors, moved back to Aleppo that, because that's where my father wanted us to be raised. And I studied architecture there. And so I uh, grew up in this amazing city that um, has now, sadly, much of it has been destroyed. And, uh, and when I came back to the United States to go to graduate school, I went to RISD. And it was almost like I went from one world you know, the totalitarian state, um, living under the dictatorship, loving it very much because of my family and loving the, the actual people and the place going to RISD. And you can imagine what that kind of culture shock that was. And I actually saw the impact of art and artists and actually learning how to think and see the world differently. And for me, what we do with the kids now in our programs in Turkey. Uh, we have a program called Kerem House that's dedicated for Syrian refugee teenagers, ages 14 to 18, boys and girls. One of the biggest things that we work on is really teaching them how to think. They go through studio workshops that are very similar to um, art school and architecture school, where they learn how to design a project, take on a, a social project usually, and work on it in groups, um, create solutions using de design methods methodology. They're learning how to draw. They're learning how to use the computer to make their drawings. And they're using their maker space to actually build models and build structures that um, 
basically show their design and they work in teams and they learn also how to present it both orally in written form um, and visually. And so the backbone of this is really um, the art, art education uh, methodology, which I think in the end will create individuals who have portfolios that are online, go, travel wherever they go, and give them these skills that are transferable, that are very valuable, and will take them to wherever they want to be when they grow up. And so that's what we're focused on right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next is Kristen Taylor. He's <laughs> uh, she's a curator of academic programs and collections at the, mu at the Museum of Contemporary Photography at Columbia College, Chicago, uh, where she studies and creatively interprets and conceptualizes the museum's permanent collection and its exhibitions. Kristen holds a BFA in painting from 2003 from Kansas City Art Institute and an MA from Columbia College, Chicago, in visual arts management, 2007. She, you curated um, the exhibition Viewfinder, Landscape and Leisure in the Collections, which investigates humans' access to the nature through parks at demographic spaces, which is now on view at the museum, at MOCP, until September 30th. But please, can you tell us a little bit more about your work? Hi, Aaron. So I was invited here because we're actually doing an exhibition on the global refugee crisis that opens in January um, called Stateless. And um, the curator of that show could not be here today, but I'm here to represent her ideas. But the Museum of Contemporary Photography, for anyone who hasn't been there, is a part of Columbia College Chicago, which has a really dynamic photography program. Um, they use our collection to learn from, but we also host classes and groups from all over the city and region to, to teach the history of photography in relation to the, the contemporary photographers working today um, who are investigating these, these social issues of our time. Um, we consider the image of the role, the, the role of the image today um, in its many layers. So it's not just about photography, it's more about how we read images, um, the power of an image, and the responsibility of a photographer and putting images out into the world. So I think that summarizes it pretty well. <laughs> Thank you. And last but not least, Rachel Schrocki is the manager for the Human Rights Watch Development and Global Initiative Office in Chicago. She has curated and managed the organization's presence at Expo Chicago for four years, in addition to coordinating outreach and fundraising efforts for HRW Chicago. Previously, you were the Exhibition and Collections Associate at the Jane Addams Hull House Museum and the Program assist Assistant to the, doc to the Dr. William M. Scholl Center for American History and Culture at the Newberry Library. Sorry. Sorry, it's a long name. I know. <laughs> she earned her Master's in Art History from the University of Illinois at Ch Chicago with an emphasis on photography and social justice. Post and holds a post baccalaureate certificates in the art history from Northwestern University and Sotheby's Institute of Art, and, and an honors bachelor degree from the Earl uh, College in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Um, just in general, your backgrounds, all three of you, are incredible. But um, um, please tell us more about your background, also in, in connection with Human Rights Watch, because that's intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you all here and um, to see faces here in support of this, these kinds of discussions. Um, so uh, like you said, Annette, I'm the manager for the Chicago Office of Human Rights Watch. Um, we are you know, primarily a fundraising and development office, um, but partially I get to work on Expo Chicago every year, um, where we've been able to highlight human rights issues um, once a year, which is one of my just favorite parts of my job. Um, we've shown Sebastiao Salgado, Alfredo Jar. Um, we've also shown Diaz Lewis in the 34,000 Pillows Project, which is a really successful exhibit. Last year we showed um, Amber Ginsberg and Aaron Hughes uh, and their the T project, um, which focuses on men who are trapped or have been killed in Guantanamo. And this year, we're really excited to show the Rational Dress Society, which is a counter fashion collective um, in order to highlight garment um, garment 
labor abuses um, around the world. Um, so, so that's one part of our uh, office and what we do. And, and we, our presence at Expo is primarily uh, to, to raise awareness. You know, we sort of started out there as a, you know, we were trying to, to maybe sell some art and, and fundraise. And then we quickly realized that we are not art dealers. Um, and nobody was going to come into our booth to buy an expensive piece of art necessarily. So we decided to sort of turn that on its head and build awareness through the project. So we began to ask artists to create a project um, based on some of our work, or we went to artists who were doing work that really fit with the, the work that we do. And of course, at Human Rights Watch, we are on the ground at, in 90 different countries around the world. We work on tons and tons of issues, um, th thematic issues about uh, you know women's, the women's rights or children's rights, but we also work um, regionally in Africa, Asia, Australia. Um, and those things often, those those topics often merge together. Um, so there's a, a bevy of issues for us to work with when we are curating an exhibit. Um, we've also worked with the Weinberg Newton Gallery, which is a fantastic gallery here in River North. Um, it, uh, they they sort of helped us get into curating art projects um, based on the work that we do. Uh, so the 34,000 Pillows project was, you know, the, the, it was a, a, the result of that partnership. Um, and it's still going today. It was a foresight project. Um, it was shown in, in Virginia, kind of all over the United States. Um, and just a little bit of background about that. Uh, there are, well, in 2015, uh, anyway, there were 34,000 people detained in the United States every night. Um, and the cost of that was $159 per person. Of course, that's increased um, quite dr dramatically. Oh, sure. So there were, in 2015, when the project was commissioned, there were 34,000 people detained in the United States every day. Uh, the cost of that was $159 per per pillow, essentially, to the taxpayers. So the artists then created, the, the goal is for them to create 34,000 pillows. They are made out of clothing donated to us from folks who have traveled to the United States. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's really quite an amazing project. So um, that, was, that was sort of our, the beginning of our engagement with uh, pro artwork to do with immigration. So. Fantastic. Start. Yeah. Um, well, at first, I want to. I'm. I'm personally impressed uh, by our panelists. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's incredible, and and I don't, don't want to thank Leslie because she really helped me figure out, you know, how to bring this together. We've got, you know, the human rights, we've got the photography, and we've got Syria, which is very, very dear to my heart specifically uh, because of of Omar and what he's opened up our eyes to. So I think this is a really great panel. And with that said, I'm just going to open it up right now for the the three of you, and we'll pipe in uh, if we feel like it, um, uh, on, on one question, and then they'll be directed individually. Uh, so the first question is the basis of this panel, uh, which is, do you think the photographic images you're seeing today, and I'm talking about you know, every, every way in which we see them, whether it's social media, TV, newspapers, for those of us who still read newspapers, um, do you think that the images you're seeing today have had an effect on the refugee crisis? And if so, how? Um, Lena, you want to go for it? Uh, I think that definitely, um, this, with the Syrian crisis specifically, we've seen that it was uh, delivered really via images and via video. So I think that you know the Syrian revolution, you know, even before the humanitarian crisis and the humanitarian and refugee crisis itself is definitely. Um, one, the war, all of it has been very, very visual and vivid and also very immediate. You know, if you're following this, you could actually see daily um, what was happening in Syria. And uh, I do think that it had a huge effect in terms of gaining global empathy. So people, ordinary people care very much about Syrians and about the refugee crisis. And, uh, and they followed it very closely. I don't think it had an effect on ch making 
making change because the crisis continues. And I think the refugee crisis specifically, you know, after the Amran, not the Amran, after the Elan picture, and that kind of highlighted the refugee crisis that was uh, the traveling towards Europe, which kind of made it, you know, it was everybody went crazy. You know, all these people are going to Germany and the people drowning and um, the detention centers and that journey through from Turkey to Germany and across Europe, I think that created a very, made everybody be at very high alert, which actually had a negative impact which we see even here in the U United States where um, we had the far right movements kind of be ignited saying, see, we told you they're coming to take over. We don't know who they are. They are terrorists. And suddenly refugee equaling terrorists happened because of that movement. And for, for me, and for many Syrians, the frustration was is that why was everybody caring so much about refugees and not caring about stopping people from becoming refugees? And until now, that is the frustration. It's much, much less because there's over 6 million Syrian refugees outside the country and over 6 million internally displaced. So we have a crisis of 12 million people no longer living in their homes. And so it's almost too late. But as it was happening, we saw that people People cared about refugees, people wanted to help refugees, but people didn't want to think about why are these people becoming refugees. There is a source root problem and nobody was taking care of that and until now nobody is taking care of that. And that's the real tragedy of this specific crisis where it would have been completely unavoidable. Um, a lot of times when I give talks, I start by asking the audience how many Syrian refugees existed before 2011. And the answer is zero. And so it's almost impossible to even think about the word Syria without sticking the word refugee right next to it anymore. It's almost they go together. But less than eight years ago, this was not a problem. And so that's the real tragedy in it. I think that images do move many, many people. I mean, organizations like ours wouldn't be able to function without the empathy of ordinary people like everybody here who give because they care. But to actually end a war, I don't know. I don't think it will be an image that will end Syria's war. I think images can also be dangerous um, because you, you keep bringing up empathy. And empathy is, is what the goal is with the photojournalists. Um, but it almost removes you so far from that, um, that experience because it's not something that, that we can understand here. So then there's this kind of othering that happens. And, and like you said, that now people have synonymous Syrian with refugee, and that was not the case 10 years ago. Um, and images have definitely played a role in that. You know, if you're skimming the, the news and you see just the headlines or the, an image with it, um, sometimes it's so heartbreaking that you shut down. And I think with a lot of art photographers, they try to fill some of that middle ground where it's thought provoking and it's, it's empathy provoking, but it's not um, going to make you feel so overwhelmed that you can't act or you can't change or you can't connect with that individual as someone that could actually be you. Um, and that's where artists can really fill in. And I feel like this artist on the back wall is a great example of how different those pictures are from the journalism we see of, of the Mexico-US border situation. Um, and also the, the text is a big role in that too. And that's something where you want people to spend the time. But we have so many images we're reading every day and so much news we're reading. I think the, the statistic I read for 2014 was that there's 1.3 billion photographs taken per day. So it's just we're just flooding the world with images. Um, and that definitely has negative, negative consequences. You know, I think Human Rights Watch, you know, in, sort of, in one way, our currency is really text. We write long reports that, that document um, with unimpeachable evidence what's happening. And, you know, there can be 100, 150 pages. And unless you're maybe a policy wonk or we're presenting this to you, um, to, to someone as a, as a verifiable proof of an, a rights abuse that is happening, you know, sometimes a photograph can really distill those 150 pages down to an instantaneous argument for what's happening. Um, so we often partner with professional photographers like Marcus Bleas, 
Hinsdale, Anastasia Taylor Lind in the field to, to take these photographs as part of our, our documentation of proof. Um, but I think one of the things I appreciate about Omar's photographs is that they are, there is this you know, multivalent interiority, these dreams of what, what's happening to, to folks on their subconscious when, when the world is sort of falling apart, that you don't necessarily get that when you're just giving an interview to a Human Rights Watch investigator. Um, so I, I just, I really appreciate that work. But I also think that art as a, as a witness is helpful because so many governments and I mean, they just don't want to hear about it anymore. They're sort of exhausted, but they're, they're overwhelmed with the 1.4 billion photographs taken every day. I know that um, last week we met with a man who just resettled in Chicago um, who spent five years on Manus Island in Australia. And there was a art exhibit in Sydney about Manus Island and you know, he sort of was a little bit involved in that from a distance. Um, and most folks in Sydney didn't understand about detention on Manus Island, that there are 1,600 folks detained there. Many of them have been there for four to five years. And there's just sort of no hope of getting out. The suicide rate is very high. It costs $8,000 to apply, a non-refundable fee, just to go in, as a journalist to, to see Manus Island. And, you know, unless you are well healed or you know the New York Times or something is behind you it's gonna be very difficult to go there and, and interview these men so an art exhibit um, is one way of sort of telling their stories from a distance um, and and spreading the word that these things are happening so it's 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 a difficult balance I think between you know getting overwhelmed and voyeurism and telling stories yeah, um, it, it, it dawned on us just now that there may be some people in here um, uh, who don't know the context of photojournalism versus fine art. Um, so with that said, because we just sort of assumed that, uh, and uh, apologies, uh, because we're, that is what we're talking about is, um, so photojournalism, for those that might not know, and there's no easy definition, so you know, all you photo people who are staring at me right now, don't get down on me. Um, but predominantly, photojournalists are hired to go photograph a specific situation for a specific group, whether it's a newspaper, a magazine, an NGO, whatever, uh, to portray what is happening. Versus fine art, um, just think of museums. I think that's easy enough. And some galleries. Um, uh, so, um, we have individual questions, but I mean, any of you can jump in afterwards. Um, so, Kristen, you started talking about the show that, um, that you're going to be doing uh, with, with, with Natasha. Uh, you recently had an Ai Weiwei exhibition in January, in, uh, yeah, previously in January. You're having this refugee show. Uh, and we were interested what you think the role of the museum is when presenting such important issues. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we always feel very nimble as a, our museum specifically because we're so small and we're an academic art museum. So being part of Columbia College Chicago, we don't have to worry so much about paying rent or fundraising so regularly as other um, larger museums do. So um, we try to be pretty gutsy with the type of content we show. Um, so Ai Weiwei would have never happened if we were a larger museum because he's working on so many projects all at once. And um, he kept giving us a maybe. Our director kept asking if he would consider having his first museum exhibition in Chicago at our museum. And he was interested. He wasn't sure. Um, and she was asking him also to exhibit his photographs because he's not really known so much as a photographer, but photography has always been a part of his practice. Um, so about three months, I think, before the show opened, he finally said yes. And because we're so small and flexible, we shifted the whole calendar for the next year and, and fit it in and were able to produce this I think pretty fantastic exhibition, um, which also covered um, the process of making his human flow documentary. If you guys have not seen that, um, it's a great documentary on the global refugee crisis. Um, and he's connecting to it from a very personal level as being someone who's been pushed out of his country, um, of China, because of his practice as an artist um, that is very controversial where he lives. So um, yeah, that exhibition, I think, um, 
it, because of us being the museum that we are and the size that we are, we were able to bring it here and show Chicago Ai Weiwei. Um, the upcoming exhibition is eight different artists, and a lot of them are not so well known, and that's usually the kind of space we fill, uh, people that are working um, kind of up and coming a lot. Sometimes we'll take risks on, on showing people that normally other uh, museums won't consider because they don't have such huge resumes, but we'll see a really interesting idea that they're working on. Um, so the eight different artists are are making work about different areas. It's not all about Syria, but um, it's definitely a part of it. Uh, we have an artist working about the Mexico-US border um, who creates large paper nets, basically. Um, and yeah, we, we're kind of all over the place, but we consider ourselves, I think I said this in the beginning, that the responsibility of the image and the way that people read images is, is key. So um, the way we approach our exhibitions is usually political. Um, so we're after that, um, I'm trying to think what else is next. We had, yeah, we had a, a big exhibition about uh, gender identity, and we had one about the Peck Coke environmental crisis in the southeast side. So it's kind of always political. Um, we talked a lot about the fact that there's so many images out in the market today, and all of you are saying it as negative, and we all are because we're not being able to process it, we're not being able to divide them, put them into little boxes and figure out what is good and bad photography and issues. Um, Marcus Bleasley is a close friend of mine and I know he works very closely with Human Rights Watch and uh, it's really directed towards you in the way that the organization, and I don't know if you, or how you really think about it, but how do you use photography in the ways of your projects? Because you have incredible guys going out there and um, I've also met Marcus coming home, and uh, it's tough. Yeah. And so we're really on that side too. Is that for us, it's really important to understand what they bring back to the project and how you look at the photographs and how you use them from there. Yeah. Well, I can, I can speak to uh, some of the ways that we're trying to amplify media. So I know that two years ago or three years ago, every report that we released, we released um, as, photo essay along with it. Um, you know, like I was describing our reports, it might not be completely accessible, right? 150 pages, who's going to read that, even if it's online. So the photographs told those stories often, or they acted as a catalyst for someone to read more. Um, so if you clicked on the link to the report, you could read the report, but there was also a photo gallery. We're now also releasing um, two-minute videos, often produced by the same folks who are taking the photographs with every report. Um, and we have the largest social media presence of any NGO of our kind. Um, so we flood Facebook and Twitter and all of our researchers who tweet um, you know, with, with all of these videos as a way of you know, not only honoring the stories of folks who you know, are, are telling their truths, but also the, the people who are in the field listening to them, making sure that we are um, disseminating those as broadly as we can. Um, you know, Marcus makes incredible incredible work and he's so thoughtful about you know is is it all right for me to take this photograph is it you know it's very sensitive and he's you know needed to take some some time I think to to absorb probably the last 20 years of work so um, you know we're hugely grateful for his eye his sensitivity um, and his his art in in every way so thank you Pardon me? Um, Lena and I met, um, I don't know, Hannah, I think last summer. last summer, yeah, when we were doing, uh, when we first showed Omar's work, and, um, and so this is really sort of directed towards what, um, we know, uh, you know, the little bit, uh, from Karam is that, uh, she works with, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, women in Syria who make products and they sell them here, and the money goes directly back to them. Um, and so we, we were very excited to work with her then. And, and we were, Annette and I were wondering if the women that you work with in Syria are aware of the ways in which Syrians are being portrayed and what they think, it, photographically once again. Yes, there, uh, people are, not just those women, but 
most Syrians and most Syrian refugees are very much aware that uh, they are being covered in the media or not. And so when I started traveling back uh, to, I went into Syria in 2011 and 2012, and then it became too dangerous for me to cross the border. So we were doing a lot of work around the border and in camps and working with women and children. And from 2011 to 2014, um, the biggest question everybody would ask, whether it was a mother or a teacher or people that we would meet, everybody would ask is, where is the world? Um, where is America? Where is Obama? Those were a lot of questions all the time and constant because it was almost like everybody was waiting that it just hasn't gotten bad enough for people to do something, but people will do something because we know we're doing our job, which is their job. They thought, even from the beginnings of the revolution inside the country, was the camera phone. Um, and, and all of these activists and so, so many students and young people just taking to the streets and recording it and uploading it and so many of the stories stories of you'll hear, um, like Omar and others, that uh, you hear now about all of the people that are, are being declared dead in prisons from the regime who died under torture. So many of those old, old, like those first people from those first years were students who were detained because of them documenting the atrocities, documenting protests, documenting whatever they had on their phones and uploading that um, to, to, for the world to see. And with time after that, there was a moment where people began, it began to settle in. I think after 2015, definitely after the, the election, of Trump, um, it really began to decline that that question of where is the world, and it kind you begin to see people trying to settle into their to their lives, um, and it became more about what do we do next, where do we go to create our futures, and it became you see people now really focused on their communities and on their kids' futures. Um, the women that we work with uh, making the soap, um, we, they're split into two groups. One, the larger group is still outside. Damascus, and they're still doing this work um, in secret. Um, and the, uh, there's a group of women who had to leave, and they're in Turkey, in Istanbul. And actually, they started training other women in their neighborhood to do this work. So now the, the products come from two places, but it's one group that still works together um, online, on Skype, on WhatsApp. Everybody's very, very connected. So it wasn't just the camera, but also having connection to, to internet um, really affected the way this crisis played out because everybody now is scattered but still very much connected through their phones. So the phone plays a, a very important part of um, the Syrian crisis. And uh, I think that um, one of the more powerful ways that we work with kids is actually giving them the camera it's because we were also tired of um, always having them photographed. And we were tired of seeing images of Syrian children being photographed and the way that they were portrayed. And obviously, we're not photographers, but um, we felt that they, uh, were, they lose a lot of their power when it was only their images being taken by journalists. And so we wanted to create photography workshops for the kids to actually learn how to take their own pictures and tell their own stories through their photographs. And, they, and the kids find that along with writing, those two um, tools, find they find it very powerful to begin to tell their own stories. So journalism actually is a very popular workshop with our students at Kerem House. And they're always interested in looking at journalism from both the photographs and the text and telling their own stories. And I think that that's one of the ways that we could actually have them move that forward. Um, and the last thing I wanted to respond to something that you said earlier is that we also as an organization have found many times problematic the way that um, violent pictures are shown and how do we actually make that choice as, an, as a humanitarian organization to show a violent image or not. And it's also very difficult because the violence is there and that is truth. But at the same time, you do you turn people away? Do you turn people away from supporting the, the cause? And so it's always a very difficult balance between what do we show and what do we don't show. And 
and also not sugarcoating images because a lot of times with refugees now you see also the other side of it which is like the superhero story like the refugee who you know saved the baby falling from the building and so now refugees are okay or like the refugee who's like every refugee is like a like a five star chef and opening up these restaurants and so you have these like really really amazing success stories of refugees but it's also very difficult because we don't expect any community to all be these amazing superpower people like they're all, they're normal people you're going to have people that like rise up very fast and people that are introverted and people that don't contribute right away and that's okay because that's actually how we all live but refugees are just put on this very very high level and so the representation of refugees actually I feel go between those two extremes and it's hard to show reality when there's so many of those images. Sorry, I have one thing to add to that, and absolutely, I, what you just said made me think of a quote that I saw. Omar, actually, I was watching an, a, maybe an interview you did with him, but it was been preparing for this, reading a lot about him, and he said something about refugees being over-photographed but underseen, and that really stuck with me, and I think it's great that you're teaching photojournalism to the people who are living it, because their, their depictions of their lives are gonna be very different from somebody on the outside looking in, and that's something that is always, you know, about just the role of the photographer, that camera, you're, you're instantly set up as an outsider. But if you're photographing your life, the, the empathy that's received through it is different. So. Um, I just uh, wanted to respond to that. I really I appreciate what you said. And I think with the 34,000 Pillows Project, although it's 3D, um, sculptural, sculptural. Um, one of the most powerful parts of that project is that everyone was invited to create the pillow, particularly folks who were donating the material, so people who migrated to the United States or were refugees. And over and over again, we heard stories of of the sewing of the pillow being a cathartic process, and people were, you know, putting patterns that were important to them onto the fabric, like sometimes broken hearts or family mementos or things inside you know, inside jokes or stories that meant a lot to them in the creation of this pillow. And then, and, and they wanted to give it away back to the artists who were then, you know, selling it to donate money to organizations that would support folks. So, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a way that people felt like they could be seen, I think, in a, in a time where maybe people feel fetishized or it just is, it's kind of overwhelming. Um, and kind of going back to the Ilan Kurdi photograph, uh, Peter Buchard, who's our director of emergencies, he wrote one of our sort of most uh, clicked on dispatches about his decision to share that photograph. He has quite a social media following and he, you know, he just kind of wrote about how he, he saw his shoes and he remembered tying his, his children's shoes and how difficult it was for him to share that photograph. But he was more enraged by you know, the leaders in the EU and in Turkey who weren't doing anything to, to, to help the process of why are these folks coming over on these boats and there's more to, to be done. Um, so I, I would suggest uh, checking that out. It's an interesting short piece. Well, it's interesting because with that said, it's almost a perfect segue to the final question and then we'll take some, you know, do a Q&A, but, um, you know, we come from a fairly biased perspective um, that, uh, and I, I'm kind of thinking we, we all may feel the same way, which is, uh, um, is that we, um, we don't find that what we're seeing today, we can talk about the photographs, um, but we also have all realized that n nothing's really changing. Right, um, and so we're wondering from you all, and then from you all, um, that it, do you think it's possible for fine art photographers to have a greater effect um, on change than documentary photographers? You can think for a second. Yeah, I, no, I'm not an expert. I mean, it's it's a tricky thing because I think it's so personal the kind of reactions that people have. Um, I'm thinking of the first artist that I saw personally that really struck a chord with me is Alfredo Yar, which you, you mentioned earlier. And his, the piece that really uh, stuck with me was just the Newsweek covers of while the Rwanda crisis was going on. The 100 days that a, a million people were killed. And he just 
laid out every Newsweek cover during that time. And finally, after 17 weeks, they finally dedicated a cover. But it just sort of highlighted our priorities. And it really just hit me in the face of thinking that I've never forgotten that piece. I think everybody's experience is different. And that's where you know galleries like yours and, and museums and these spaces that support artists that are interpreting it in different ways is important, because not one artist is going to do something the same for everybody. Um, but as far as making lasting change, I mean, we all know that art is a very fundamental part of a democratic society. And as long as we can express ourselves, we're still living in a, in a pretty civilized way. And so um, I don't know if it's the answer, but I know that it's important. I think I think that it's a fine art photography, um, especially thinking about Alfredo. Um, it, it, it's a it's a way that we can connect with our humanity, and and that is that is moving forward. In thinking about the thirty four thousand pillows project, although that's not fine art photography, you know, we, here we are, you know, in twenty eighteen, and there are thousands of kids separated from their parents. So it feels hopeless um, often, but I think. Um, it, it, fi fine art is is at the the core of the best things of who we are, and so I think that if we can connect with that, that is how we can kind of stay on that path, even if it seems sort of like throwing rocks down a hole. Like it's just no, there's no exact change, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but no. I mean, I, I mean, we li we like that answer <laughs> um, because that's the uh, you know the foundation of the, of this new business that we're doing. And and just as a side note, we're we're, we're actually um, right after the art fair, we have a booth at the art. I don't think I said that. We have a case as a booth at the art fair as well, um, and we 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 are kind of made a booth into a refugee tent uh, based on and using Omar's images once again uh, in a different way than we did in Arl uh, a couple of months ago. Um, but we're actually uh, right after the fair going down to Texas to scout because we're so pissed off as to what's going on and we haven't been able to, you know, get, you know, we, we're still waiting for our 501c3 so we haven't, you know, it's being self-funded and but we're just not waiting. We can't wait. And so we're going to scout and Abe Morell has graciously agreed to um, be the photographer. No money, he doesn't want any money. And this is what it's about. And we're, we're because we see all these pictures in Mexico, but once again, um, all these children, are, you know, it's this, this something has to change. And so we're hoping through Abe, who, you know, we're using him, he's using us. That's collaboration. Maybe that's not the way we all define it, but. <laughs> That's, you know, that's how we're looking at it. And so, you know, we, we firmly do believe that. And with that said, I think, you know, we should open it up um, if anybody has any questions or they don't agree or whatever it is you want to know about, um, you know, just feel free to raise your hand and all righty, all the way in the back. Hi. <laughs> And can I just comment on that? I, I, thank you. Um, but I think also the fact that um, what happens a little bit is that we see photojournalism in our country, but this way. In our country, we still have a discussion whether photography is art. So, you know, it comes back to the fact of understanding what tools, which is correct. I agree with you what you're saying, but I think also the fact is that you have to understand what tool is used for. And I think art can, in one way, give a different focus, and, or we believe that in one way. We have discussions, too, of course. But I think we have a tool that is very powerful because it's directed and it's very forceful when once you use it right. Photojournalism has to be there. It has to tell stories and issues, but it's also for a medium. So it's, 
it's a different way of thinking about it, and it's a, why we dare go on that path that we think that art is going to do something and create awareness, at least, is the fact that we cooperate and have partnerships, and we can cooperate with people like this. You know, people have research, people have ability, and I think that's a part of what Case is also really on the core of, and I think that that is why it's so intriguing to find out people that work with photography every single day find that there's too much out there and it's scary, which is really intriguing, Kristen, that you said, um, I found. That's just my comment to that. I don't know if anyone has a comment to it. I think, um, you know, Human Rights Watch has been thinking a lot about how to get to the movable middle, right? Folks who we think have kind of forgotten about human rights values, and, and we're trying to re-encourage that. So in thinking about this deluge of images and photographs, um, I'm also reminded that it just, for some people, they're just not affected, or they don't know, or they don't want to know, or whatever the issue is. So we've been working on trying to, to target them through social media and create uh, photo, photo stories and videos that, that will kind of, to reach them. So we, we have a short video about a, a union um, that became a sanctuary union, and it's it's sort of features a guy who by no means would ever be considered like a East Coast human rights policy wonk, right? He's a he's a union dude, and he talks about how this these seeing images of his um, union brothers who were removed and you know deported at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night um, was really important to him, and I think about feeling overwhelmed by photography, and then I think about folks who are still not reaching, you know, and, and those are the folks who hopefully are not gonna vote on November 6th, but it just, you know, making sure that we reach everyone, you know, so. Well, I, I agree that we're overwhelmed by photography, but um, I, I, I would only disagree that I am personally not overwhelmed by fine art photography. Um, yeah. uh, I'm overwhelmed by how a lot of photography just all looks the same. I mean, you know, the reality is we know Nick Oot and Eddie Adams' name because that actually, their images actually did help end the Vietnam War. Um, but today, we don't, I had to look up the names of the photographers. We know the images, we don't know the photographers. Um, and that's, that's very different, right? Um, and now everything looks the same. I can't tell one image from the next. I look at every byline in a newspaper, but I, they all look the same to me. So, but that's my, you know, bias there. Uh, other questions? Elizabeth? Um, do you think that we're just getting, there's, there's so many yeah, yeah, images, the, uh, you know, there are so many images out there that almost people are getting desensitized to all of this, you know, and, and I think that's part of it as well. Yeah. It's a cell phone. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's what I was trying to get at. And, and back to the question about the photojournalism, I'm in no way trying to bash photojournalists. I mean, their work is so important. And without it, we wouldn't have any, like, nearly the awareness that we have of the situation. So it's just, I think, in the context of this, where you're asking about the, the, the separate kind of role an artist can have, the way that we can use photography beyond photojournalism, but not removing photojournalism at all. Um, and a lot of photojournalists are also artists, you know, and they, they switch back and forth, and that, that is some of the most striking imagery you see because they're thinking about how you read a picture, you know, in perfect compositions while also documenting, you know, a tragic event or a great event or, you know, something newsworthy. So did you have another question about that? <laughs> Paul, you had a question? I have a question. I don't know anything about journalism, but I'm gonna, but I think don't the, those picks get filtered through an editor that's making choices based on advertisers? And so that's why they start looking the same because they're not really taking up, supposedly they're neutral, where an art photographer has a position that's directly connected with them and there's less people involved in getting that concept out. So would the art gallery, if this is true, and it might not be because I don't know anything about it, but would the art gallery have a, a, a stronger platform because it could be a more direct position of an opinion with less filters in, or is that off base? Well, I mean, you know, we also, it, most, most art galleries are for profit. No, I'm not <laughs> so, not yeah, money, so we have a bias too. They, they don't have like advertisers that are gonna complain because you, right. 
have this, you know, Toyota's in this picture of this horrible thing, so we're not going to show it because Toyota's our advertiser kind of thing. Is there more of a chance for a, a stronger message to come out in a gallery because of that, or is that nonsense? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Maybe, hold on. I think I know. No, do you know? Well, I think it's interesting <laughs> what you said at the end because it was more the fact that I, um, can, we, can we take art outside of the gallery space? Is there a possibility of thinking that why is it, I th I, why do we elevate in the value of art inside the gallery? Why can we not take it outside of it and find a way to be able to get that word out there? That's really what we're talking about more. So it's, um, I don't, I think the photojournalism in general has issues, but they do the issues and they are there and it's a tough media out there. I mean, all the newspapers, we don't read newspapers anymore. Sorry, I mean, we don't and they're going bankrupt and so photographers don't get jobs anymore, and so it becomes a different way of just buying stock images or the same story from another, from another newspaper or another issue. But I think the issue here a little bit also is seeing art and why is it always all of a sudden become important because it's inside a gallery. Do we not have the, do we not have the way of seeing art outside of it and taking a judgment and having that feeling inside saying this is really something that moves me, it's art, it's something that's good. I think that's also a little bit my comment. I'm sorry. It's just well, that's, uh, that's also what Case is doing. Um, we're, we're, we're going to be um, giving a grant to a photographer, photographers, depending upon what they need, to fulfill a, 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 a grant that we'll announce. You know, uh, the first one will be dealing with children's human rights. And the photographs will all be done outside. Um, you know, the art world caters to itself. We, we generally... Um, you walk into an art gallery, most people, not, not all, because you want to, so you've already got an audience that's biased, and they already agree with you. They're coming in to see art. So we're putting it all back out in the public, back right on billboards, kiosks, bus shelters, you name it, so that we can teach. You know, And, and one person, when we started this whole dialogue way back, um, a, a friend of Annette's asked us how we um, define success. And we both just looked at each other. It was like, wow, that's a heady one, right? And it's something we could ask every, all of us. Like, how do we define success? And we, without hesitation, we both said the same thing. It's like, if you change one person's mind, that's success, because that person has friends. And it's the ripple effect. Um, we call it the red line. So the red line's very important in our logo. It's the thread that keeps us all together. And so that, that's, uh, that's our shtick. Uh, question? Yeah? Do you see any negativity coming from viewers when they look at fine art of refugees or people going through crisis and calling it pose or exploitation? We talked about fetishizing. Do you see any issues coming up from making it art instead of a documentation or something? Kristen, you want Yeah. I mean, I think that goes back to sort of um, the point we were talking about earlier about um, the relationship you have to your subject. And, excuse me, I think that there is definitely dangerous territory there with fetishizing, and that's, that's something that all photographers have to consider when they're photographing the human subject. Um, the, the why, why you're doing it, what your motives are, and in, in the art world it gets tricky because there's so much money around art, and I, I know also, you know, with um, like something happening in Syria, it can seem like a luxury to make art about that in a time where you should be like on the ground working and, you know, in, in shelters and helping people immediately. Like, what is art doing? Um, so, yeah, there's, it's, it's difficult water, I think, to tread um, to, to do it right. And that's where I think any time that you can have somebody representing their own story um, is a great is a great opportunity and that's with like Omar I think why you love this work so much is because he's able to show us humor and if a different artist who wasn't living that tried to make humor out of this it would it would go terribly wrong and, and, and I also think to that point that um, there are there is a lot of art out there um, being made for all the wrong reasons but uh, with a museum or a gallerist it's our job to weed it out. And, um, and if we don't, then we have to stand by it and explain it. Um, it doesn't mean we're God. <laughs> you know, we're not always right, but you should be able to have a backbone and support your own um, beliefs, especially if your name's on the door, if it's a museum where you're taking, you know, some of it, you know, it's public money, you, you know, you owe it to your audience to be able to support, uh, to, to explain what you support. Uh, yes? Are 
those fine art or are those documentary? No, that was an example of how photojournalism used to work well because there wasn't such a deluge of images today. Vietnam actually was the quote, first picture war. It brought home, you know, prior, you know, the New York Times had a policy that you couldn't put a corpse on the cover of the paper. Uh, after the, 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 the coverage of Vietnam, uh, photojournalism, I mean, it, it was just, you know, everybody, well, not everybody, ph photographers, you know, <laughs> um, were really, it was a very powerful medium. And, but today, I mean, even though there are really great photojournalists, there are too many, it's, it's, it's watered down, there are too many images. And so that was an example of w what it, it could do and it's not, we don't feel it's doing today. Because once again, we don't know the names of the photographers taking most of the images today. Yeah, in the back. Oh, Annalise. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to push back a little bit about the ideas about photojournalism and the deluge of images. I think it depends a lot on the context of the images, how they've been presented, um, what story you're telling. For example, just to give an anecdotal story, um, I think also this idea feels a little bit like it's coming out of a little bit of a liberal bubble. Like I like that you mentioned this vegan guy who enjoys seeing these photos and he's living a little bit of a different experience. And just to give you an example, my mom is from Mississippi, lives there now, and um, isn't really engaging with the news very often, isn't engaging with images, is not engaging with photojournalism. If she is engaging with images, it's very generally dog videos, which I enjoy a lot. But I got her into the gallery to see a show that we did about the global refugee crisis last year. And one of the images was of a, it was taken by a photojournalist. And it was of um, a man in Nepal who was saying goodbye to his daughter for possibly the last time because he could not apply for refugee status, but his wife and their children could, and so she was leaving. And my mom looked at that image and she said, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. And so having the ability to bring work into a different place, to spend time with it, to focus on the individuals, it's amazing how many people, we think they're just inundated with images and, and it's, but we have to think about what kinds of images, what news sources are they looking at, what are their primary concerns in the places that they're from? My mom's a nurse. You know, she's not spending time in galleries. She's not looking at art. But that was a moment. I just want to respond to that quickly. Um, in in 2015, when we showed 34,000 pillows over and over again, and at Expo Chicago, so like I'm going to imagine a kind of liberal bubble, over and over again what we heard was, I didn't know, I didn't know. And you would see people do the math in their head of 159 times, like what that meant to the taxpayer, like how many pillows, like the, the sort of um, physical embodiment of, of what, what that meant for people. And you know, and here we are, of course, three years later, things are worse. And so I'd like to think that as a, as a sort of a little bit of a trickle, like that you know, f folks are becoming more aware. The Obama administration's policies were n certainly not great either. So you know, we, st we started there, and, and, and hopefully we just be, were able to spread some kind of awareness or uh, platform for people to connect with. OK, I think we have time for one last question. Um, I mean, as you all know, Seven million last year alone, which I believe is the largest number of forcibly displaced people. Let's not even talk about this distinction between migration and, and refugee status. So my question is essentially for a human rights watch question. With all of these people in these various parts of the world, South Africa, let's see, uh, Cambodia, we have a large population of the world of people who are stateless. How do you make your decisions as to what you will prioritize? I see a lot here about Syria, and I'm wondering about the rest of the world. Uh, that's a great question, um, and one that we get quite a bit. Um, so w w some of the ways that we prioritize the work that we do is what kind of impact can we have? Um, you know, if is there, you know, we do case studies, um, can we have some measurable impact? Another way that we uh, analyze uh, our potential work is 
is there someone else working on that project already? Are we able to take something that does not have a lot of, um, you know, there's just not a lot of exposure about that issue, and can we can we bring that to the world? So Manus Island, for instance, you know, it's just not talked about very often in Australia, and we are continuing to work on that quite a bit. Um, so. Right, and we're you know a larger NGO, but we're you know, only 500 of us, and there's lots of issues going on. So um, those are two of the ways that we we try to decide on what we do, and then of course we ha it has to sort of fall within our various wheelhouses. And do we have an expert who can who can work on that? Um, you know, we work on so many issues that oftentimes we do, but some sometimes we don't, and we have to work on getting funding for that. Um, so that's a great question. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to thank the three of you. Um, I, I think that we personally could go on and on, but because I've been to so many of these discussions and I can't stand it when they go past an hour, um, we are going to end. Uh, we'll be sticking around if you all want to um, ask us any questions. I want to thank uh, Annalise and Artworks Projects for letting us uh, take uh, take up their space. We have an email list in the back if anybody wants to know more about uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm blind, so I, I think it's an email list that you're showing me, to, to, so that if you would like to get onto um, uh, cases mailing list or artworks mailing list, and then the quick PSA, please come by Expo Chicago, see the Human Rights Human Rights Watchers booth, see Cases booth, talk to us, challenge us, or just say it's great. Um, any of it would be great. So thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you.